Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the High Vault Web Talk. It is 3 p.m. Central European Time, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And on the east side, it's 9 p.m. Singapore Time. And we are live here, Uwe, in Dresden, where it is the only part of Germany today where it was a little bit sunny. And so it's a hot spot here. And with me, as always, Dr. Uwe Kaltenborn. Hello, Uwe. Hello, Florian. How are you? I'm doing fine. And you? Also, I think we have another nice picture, but before, we are in what location today for the web talk? Yes, yeah, so we are uh, again at the same place as uh, last time. Nevertheless, when we have a look around, then we will see different uh, objects uh, here in the room. So, uh, on your left side, we have uh, the DC test modules are two of them. Then we have an exciter transformer we need for a large test transformer. And uh, opposite to us, there we have an, a reactor for 380 kV and uh, 14 uh, megawatt uh, test capacity. Mm -hmm. so and this is what we have today here in the background. Nevertheless, you already mentioned yes. our new photo here. So today the topic is monitoring and uh, we try also to differentiate a little bit uh, between testing and monitoring. And uh, the major question is always what does monitoring mean? Is that a measurement over the lifetime? Is that a permanent monitoring? And these are questions we have to take up uh, during the discussion today as well. And the discussion, of course, can be participated by you as you watch us uh, by Slido, which is right. very nice that you connect us uh, with Slido and we take your questions. Uwe, how does it work? Yeah, so you have different uh, uh, possibilities to access Slido, either via the web link or via uh, the... Uh, our code you can see on the screen right now. Uh, with that, you can access uh, to our, our hashtag our web talk, and there you can ask your question. The question will show up here, and uh, then we will also forward that to our colleagues we will have here with us. And uh, very special today, uh, it's a purely German round in the moment, and that will be also one of our questions. Uh, why is Germany one of the front runners in terms of DC uh, land side cables. Nevertheless, to introduce mm -hmm. a little bit the topic of monitoring, we have prepared a short explanation video we would like to see right now. Right. <laughs> Monitoring could be one of the quality assurance measures and uh, condition assessment and fault localization is a topic of that. To do something like that, uh, it's also important to have the right power source behind. If it's not the power grid, then we have our test systems here. When we're discussing partial discharge measurements, then we have certain challenges for uh, AC, we can have a phase resolved resolution, but if it's DC, 
then we have an issue how to find the location and also the real discharge energy. To do so, we have developed some new technologies like TruePD, where we do a reference measurement to get a transfer function, which allows us then to recalculate the effective measurement or PTs. And as you can see here, we are already transferring from the lab to certain field trials. And uh, there we would like to discuss and also the results of uh, this kind of measures. Excellent, and about all this we will talk with our panel, with our experts today. Cable monitoring first, field experience with DC cables. And I'd like to introduce you to our first guest and expert is Anita Saupe from 50 Hertz Transmission. Hello, Anita. Nice that you are here. You are the asset management linear asset monitoring there and you have a master in um, from the TU in Berlin and in the field of photonics and electrical energy transmission and you're an expert in monitoring high voltage cables, exactly what we talk about today. So cable monitoring, you say, enables the balance between efficient use of the power supply network and the asset protection. Why is monitoring of network assets becoming more and more important? Yeah. Yeah, at first, thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, monitoring our technical assets um, sometimes enables us to, to assess the condition of the asset for, um, for a certain extent. And with monitoring, we have the chance to detect cable faults uh, with a higher probability already at the, at the development stage. So we, we have a possibility to detect an upcoming failure. Okay. So, and based on, on this information, um, we are able to plan maintenance and repair actions in a, in a better way. And based on this, we are able to reduce outage times and reduce costs uh, that depends on the outage times. All right, thank you very much. We are continuing here in our panel with uh, Professor Peter Birkholz. He has the chair of uh, speech recognition and cognitive systems here in uh, Dresden. He, you received uh, your PhD in signal processing from the University of Rostock. And after postdoctoral research positions, Rostock, you were in Aachen, you became a professor at the TU Dresden in 2014. And your main topics are the research include articulary speech synthesis, silent speech interfaces and measurement technique for speech research. And since 2018, you are cooperating with high volt proof technique here to apply modern methods of signal processing and to monitor of high voltage power cables. And of course, you are at the IEEE and the IEEE Signal Processing Society. Professor Brinkholz, Birkholz, um, intelligent signal processing can provide important impulse for the next generation monitoring of high level voltage power cables. Monitoring of cable and speech recognition, where is the link between these two subjects? Quite different subjects. Uh, yeah, that's true as it seems uh, at the first sight. But in fact, there, there, is, a, there is a link between uh, speech synthesis mm -hmm. um, uh, or the human vocal tract and um, yeah, electric cables. And that is, uh, you, can, you can model the wave propagation on both electric cables and um, uh, the propagation of acoustic waves in the, vo in the vocal tract um, with the same model. And that is a so-called transmission line model or transmission line circuit. And that has the same structure independently from the type of waves. So acoustic waves or electric waves. And uh, yeah. So um, we can exploit this similarity to, um, to apply methods that have been uh, developed for the simulation of wave propagation in the vocal tract um, to the simulation of waves on electric cables and also the other way around. So we can uh, use or apply analysis methods that have been developed for speech 
to the analysis of partial discharges, mm -hmm. um, for example, in uh, electric cables. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for your first statement and for the first question. Continuing here on our panel with Dr. Christian Henze. He is the CTO at Ritz Instrument Transformer GmbH. And uh, Christian Henze studied electrical power engineering at the Technische Universität Dresden. He was receiving his doctorate from the TU Dresden in 2010. And he has been working for the Ritz Group in various positions with focus on product and process development. And since 2015, he has been responsible for the manufacturing process of all Ritz factories and you are managing director of the Dresden plant since two years since 2019. Your statement for today's topic is the energy transition is currently one of the biggest challenges in Germany absolutely no doubt. Ritz has here the technical expertise to make an important contribution in this field of measurement in controlling and monitoring of the electrical energy systems. Now the question Dr. Henze is sensors are key for all monitoring solutions. What is the expertise here of the RITZ group? Yeah, thank you, Florian. So RITZ is a supplier of instrument transformers, uh, solid insulated mm -hmm. bus bars and cast resin products. We are a full-scale uh, supplier in the world of uh, instrument transformers. Uh, that means we can uh, assist our customers from low voltage to high voltage, with nearly all uh, thinkable applications in, in that field. That means we are able to handle different insulation systems uh, like resin imp paper impregnation, like uh, oil paper impregnation or even uh, re casted resin mm -hmm. solutions. And we are able to do the magnetic design, of course. And voltage and current sensors in our world uh, are called non-conventional instrument transformers. And we built them for decades now. And applications are in HVDC applications, in facts, test labs, transportation systems, uh, like the Transrapid, for example. Uh, Ritz developed uh, the VT sensors for, for that project. We have our own R&D department, uh, which has the expertise to do the design and manufacturing of those products and they are able to, to realize products out of ideas. We have own solutions for the market, but we also transform the ideas of our customers into customized solutions. Excellent, thank you very much. We are continuing uh, finally with Dan Keller. He's sales manager utility business here at Highvolt Prüftechnik in Dresden. You were born in 1988. You received a degree in electrical engineering from the BA Bautzen and a degree in industrial engineering from the FH. Zwickau. You held various positions in engineering and in sales and since 2021 you are responsible for sales and business development of the monitoring solutions as a sales manager utility business here at Highvolt Dresden. Your statement to our subject today is innovative monitoring solutions for DC cables are a contribution to the reliable energy transmission of the future and as they support the operators to maximize the availability of their assets. Now the question, Highvolt is a market leader here for test equipment. What qualifies Highvolt for monitoring solutions then? Yeah, th thank you Florian. Um, to, to answer this question, um, I, would, I would ask the question, what other we, or I would like to discuss this mm -hmm. uh, topic, what are the, the special requirements to a certain monitoring um, solution, um, mm -hmm. especially concerning the HVDC cables. So first of all, uh, we have a new technology with the HVDC cables, something that is not clear um, from all physical effects, so it's uh, still the standards and recommendations are under discussion, this is the first point. Second point is, we uh, have for the cables a, a certain given structure, so it's not, not, not a complete free um, development that we can do with monitoring solutions. And the third point, we need a um, uh, reliable... That's why we are, no problem, we are, <laughs> we are broadcasting live, of course, here in an ongoing process. And there is some kind of alarm here at Highvolt going on. Uwe, what can this be? Uh, 
available. Ah. And uh, I think the filling process is now finalized and they have now to reset all the uh, uh, controls. And uh, I think we should uh, go down uh, with we, we the sound. We take down the volume for a minute continue. and we are back. Oh, now excellent. Thank now you the very problem <laughs> is solved. We okay. want Actually, Maybe I repeat, so we have yeah. here in the background the oil filling and oil processing unit and uh, we got some fresh oil uh, one hour ago and I think they are ready with the uh, filling process and that's why we got the signals and the guys have reset all the uh, uh, control system and now we should be in the lucky situation to have not longer this kind of distortions. Yeah, but in, in actually, I mean, uh, getting um, your supply for your uh, factory and everything is not the easiest thing at the moment. So you take any appointment to get it. So that's why we were here in between our show, in between our High Vault web talk. And jumping uh, back to Dan Keller, um, you can continue for some moments uh, with yeah, your... Yeah, of course. With yeah. your answers, um, I, I was I was explaining what is what are the um, the um, requirements um, to a monitoring solution. And in, in addition, that we are talking about a new technology, and we have a certain given structure. Of course, it's a long, a very long time for um, for for operation of such a system. So there is a, a very reliable support um, during the lifetime of the measuring and monitoring system ne necessary, and during all steps. That means from definition of the specification to the design of the system installation, um, it's always a strong and trustable cooperation between between us or between manufacturer of monitoring solutions and um, of the customer itself um, necessary. So, at Vias High Vault, um, uh, now, um, yeah, what, what quali qualifies High Vault, we just have to think about the characteristics. So. Highwald has an experience of more than 100 years in the field of the quality control for transmission and distribution systems. So we have an experienced, a very long experience, of course, also a skilled team with a lot of, with a lot of um, um, engineers and physics. And this allows a very deep insight in the physics also of the, of the, new, um, of the new HVDC cables, of the equipment itself. And that made Highwald in the last decades also to the innovation leader in the field of, of the quality control. So this, this is one point of the understanding. The second point is that each system that we are, re that we are producing is uh, customized and adapted to certain requirements. So there's not, no system like the other, even if they look very similar, but it's always a project management necessary. And um, so we have, a, of course, a large experience in this field. And what, what is a result out of this is that we, for all systems that we are realizing, always have a very um, trustable contact between Highwald and, and all the customers. So, and if we conclude this, we can say, okay, we have the physical knowledge, we have the experience in developing um, products and measuring systems, uh, we have the experience in, in project management and a strong customer contact, and therefore um, Highwald is qualified to realize monitoring systems and to develop monitoring systems. All right, thank you very much. We continue with a question to Christian Henze. So, high volt DC is not the typical application for an instrument transformer and an instrument transformer manufacturer as you are with RITZ. What makes DC cables interesting, especially for you? So, as mentioned uh, before, HVDC applications are not new for us. And we also have experience with AC cables. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenge is always the, the adoption to the requirements of each application. And for DC, or for this DC cable project, uh, we had to use both principles. And the key question here was the, how to deal with the environment conditions mm -hmm. when it comes to, to water and the, the temperature range. But uh, all together with the a, with a handling uh, for, for installation and also for operation. Mm -hmm. So it was, in the discussion, this was quite fast clear that um, we had to choose a, a split cordiodyne, which uh, makes it difficult or give new challenges for, for sealing and for context, mm -hmm. especially together with water. And uh, the other point, or another important point, was the electromagnetic shielding in that rough environment. And there we adopted the solution uh, that we use usually for, for voltage transformers for uh, GIS uh, switch gears or substations, and I think we 
we made the right decisions uh, to to choose or to have a look in, in our product range to to find the solution that we can use for for that H, uh, HFCT project. Mm -hmm. And talking about these different uh, cables, of course, we have Landside cables and uh, subsea cables. Anita Sauper from 50 Hertz. What is the risk to be anticipated for Landside cables? Yeah, for the for the onshore cable part, at the first point, there are a lot of crossing points. Yeah, with existing structures and. Yeah, this is like telecommunications cables or this can be railway crossings, highway crossings and all these crossing points can have an effect on the cable itself, for example, um, the thermal impact can be there. Yeah. And furthermore, um, for, for an onshore cable, there is a higher number of joints necessary and the installation uh, takes place under, under very difficult environmental conditions. Yeah. And last but not least, if we have an onshore cable, um, the... Uh, the always a risk that in the area of the onshore cable part you have interferences by third parties yeah that okay. can be manual digging or uh, like can be a mechanical digging years like this and this can have also an effect on the cable itself mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I guess, Uwe, that uh, as we are discussing um, here, cable monitoring, first field experience with DC cables, there are quite already some questions coming in via Slido. Of course, you can discuss with us and we try always to take the questions, answer them, bringing them here in the round of our experts. And then, of course, uh, nearly at the finish of our web talk, we do a second round of questioning. Uh, Uwe, how are the questions that are coming in until now. Yeah, so I would like to start with a more generic question. Uh, I think it's also very interesting to put it into this round uh, of the discussion. The question is, is monitoring necessary at all? Hmm. That means, do we really need monitoring? Or the proposal uh, from uh, the colleague who asked the question is, uh, having a redundant system might be the better solution. So uh, I think uh, there we can have uh, also different kind of views on, on that. So a typical uh, structure of the transmission system is that we have a redundancy there. Nevertheless, it's always the question how economically wise is it to double all the infrastructure? Maybe, Anita, you can give us some insights uh, from 50 Hertz if you would like to put everything in double uh, execution, double all the cables, all the transformers, all the switch gears, if okay. this is a potential solution. Okay, yeah, we have criteria about this, having redundant systems as TSO, this is still necessary. But as I mentioned before, monitoring can be a benefit on this because also if we have a redundant system, uh, there is a, a possibility to having a fault. And in case of a fault, it is necessary, also if I have a redundant system, to, um, to localize this fault and to analyze this fault. So therefore, I need the data assets for this failure. How can I get the data assets uh, when not using a monitoring system that monitors the asset over a lifetime? Yeah, maybe there are other opinions as well. Dan, you want to sell monitoring systems, oh, yeah. so you must have a very strong yeah. argument pro-monitoring. Of course, if we, if, if we talk 
die Fitur gebaut, the monitoring, normally you, you already explained the main, the main topics. The main issue, um, if a monitoring solution is um, valuable or not, is, is of course an economic question. So if we, if we think about um, the main issue, what, 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 what does it help? We can, we can reduce the downtime, we can maybe avoid even downtime. And if, an, if even a failure, that means for example a breakdown in the cable occurs, it is possible to, to, to localize the failure very fastly and reduce um, the time for, for repair. And um, if, we, if we just talk about or think about the energy that is transmitted, especially for the new um, cable projects, and it's very easy to calculate uh, uh, what, what, what does it mean to save uh, one or two days or even up to 10 days as we as we know it for the subsea cables for example for for the repair time of um, such a cable and so it's very easy to to make a calculation in which cases uh, monitoring is is um, uh, yeah suitable and and uh, valuable or valuable mm -hmm. so we, we need more from you other question yeah, so there's a question coming in. What are the typical after installation tests for HVDC cables? So this is the step before we enter into monitoring. So we have to install the cables and we should also have their certain kind of, uh, of tests. So uh, there is a certain kind of uh, large offer uh, for the test. There is a certain setting also uh, from CCRA uh, in terms of recommendations. Nevertheless, there is today no real effective standard available. So therefore, uh, I think uh, it would be also very interesting to uh, get some insights there. Dan, maybe you can yeah. give us uh, some indications uh, what's possible for the installation tests and uh, yeah, so maybe we can see then if we get additional information. Of course, yes. Um, if you if you talk about the installation test of the um, of the um, HVDC cables, there are at the moment there are two uh, yeah publications I would say where we what that can be considered. First of all is the IC six two eight nine five. This is normally a standard up to for for, for HVDC cables up to three hundred twenty kV. There's a German amendment um, like an edition um, um, published in two thousand nineteen. This extends um, the the test um, applications up to 525 kV, and the second point is a Zikre brochure um, um, 841. It's just from September to, um, 2020. There are also some recommendations, but what can we what can we say? As a maybe as an as a very f uh, yeah uh, as a summary of out of out of that, it's a new technology, and normally it's always necessary to have a discussion between manufacturer and and operator. Um, out of these discussions, there of course there are some some tendencies that can be seen. Is that um, all HVDC cables should be tested in factory and also on site? That means after installation um, with an with an AC voltage. Um, in order to detect also the uh, partial discharges and it should be followed by an um, additional um, DC test. And this is what we show also already in the, in the video, what you see saw in the video, um, the reactors, the XXL reactors and also on the, on the pictures um, behind us, um, what are possibilities for, uh, for, for a practical realization of the um, on-site testing um, of the cables. Yeah, okay. I would like to uh, keep the other questions uh, for my own in the moment because uh, I think it's uh, more worthwhile to continue with our discussion to introduce uh, some other topics uh, here as well so that we get then an um, additional context then to the questions already asked. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So our next question in the discussion goes to Professor Birkholz. Um, the HFCT sensor is acquiring a lot of data with about 250 mega samples per minute. So this amount of data as such will no big help. But what are the principles to extract information from this data? This is the interesting part about it. 
absolutely right. So we get a lot of data from this sensor produced by the company Ritz. And uh, one reason is a high sampling rate. And the other reason is that we have many of these uh, high frequency current transformer sensors along the line. So one or two of them uh, every 10 uh, kilometers. And uh, so we get a lot of data, and uh, if you want to uh, process this data, uh, we, ha we have to think carefully which of the data is, is necessary to transmit for, for a more in-depth analysis. And uh, as you said before, so we, we have this uh, project together with Highwood, which uh, is now in the third year, I would say, and there we developed uh, a little pipeline that you can see on this slide. Mm -hmm. um, where we uh, yeah, have a couple of steps that can first reduce the amount of data to process and then also uh, detect potentially the location of or, or the source of a, of a partial dis discharge that we detect. So, And what, what we have to do here to reduce the amount of data is that we first detect the signals of interest in the data stream. So we have a, a quasi-continuous input signal from the sensor and uh, we segment this uh, signal into overlapping frames and then um, we uh, classify each frame as either noise or as um, containing a signal of interest and that would for example be um, a partial discharge. And uh, for this we use uh, first uh, signal processing to generate features uh, from the uh, samples in the frame and then we use a classifier um, to, to make the decisions if, if we can just discard this frame or if we should process uh, it further. And this is a statistical classifier in our case which is based um, on, uh, on features of the autocorrelation function of the samples in the frame. Um, so, and uh, yeah, if, if we have detected a partial discharge, and that is, that is I mean, the challenge is um, that often the signal of interest is very, uh, very small. So it's uh, essentially buried in noise or it, it just uh, peaks out of the noise a little bit. And uh, so that, that is the main challenge. And using the autocorrelation of, of the signal, we can really find if there are some samples which are not uncorrelated to each other as a noise and then uh, yeah makes a detection and if you have done that we can go into the frequency domain with uh, with a Fourier transform and then look at the magnitude spectrum and the phase spectrum and from that uh, we can uh, determine uh, yeah so the the the, um, the distance that the partial dis discharge pulse traveled over the line so that is essentially then uh, intelligent signal processing. Uh, but for that we need uh, reference data. So we need to know how does a partial discharge uh, um, uh, uh, discharge impulse uh, change? How does a shape change when it travels, for example, 10 kilometers over the line? Mm -hmm. And when we know that, then we can also um, interpolate and extrapolate um, to other distances and compare simulated values with measured values. Mm -hmm. And that's a way to uh, yeah, get, get data or get information out of the data. So we not only have the oil pipelines getting here transformer oil into our transformers, but we have the data pipeline. And uh, of course, you have this uh, strong connection to Highvolt and the University of Dresden, uh, of, of Dresden that you like can connect here your knowledge and uh, bring it further on. Thank you very much for this. Um, going with the next question to first uh, Dan and then to Anita, um, are these informations sufficient to take operations? operational decisions, because this is the key point. When do you have really take action? Yeah, of course, um, uh, of course not, <laughs> to, be, to, 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 to say it from the beginning. Yeah. The information that we get, um, that means if you have the, 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 level, the level at the, at the uh, place of the origin of the partial discharges is, is, the, is the first point. But this information has to be aligned to the physics. That means we have to understand the physics of the, of the DC cable itself. Um, that means which which physics of the DC stress uh, has influence or has an influence on the time. So what does it mean? What does it practically mean? 
what what do we do with this um, um, data? This data can be transmitted to a so-called um, intelligence cluster, and this is uh, something like an expert learning system. And what we what we do there is we combine the information that we realize or that we that we collected um, together with together with um, additional information like voltage or temperature, and uh, out of this um, information we identify uh, certain failure types. This is something that is at currently um, under development. We have um, another another uh, cooperations with, with other universities for this topic that is starting already. And um, the idea is to make an, a clear, to get, to get a clear identification up or uh, idea about the failure types. And as a result out of, out of that, uh, we should we should um, get out of the system a specially resolved recommendation for a certain action, and even that, even that is just a recommendation. And it, this is now goes go to Anita. Um, the operator includes even this information just in an in a higher level system, and out of that they can make certain decisions for the complete asset. This is the idea behind it. Right, exactly. So, Anita, coming to you from 50 Hertz, um, are these information sufficient to take operational decisions? How do you cope with this? Yeah, for, for us as the TSO, the information that we can get out of the measurement data um, yeah, it must give us a possibility to, to obtain or to, to assess the condition of the asset. As Dan mentioned, it is necessary that we uh, not only have the raw data because we need to do something with the data assets and it is still necessary that we know um, based on the on the measurement data, is it necessary to take action for the monitored asset? And yeah, in, in the if the if the monitoring system detects some anomalies uh, in the recorded measurement data, it's not only necessary to have information on which which failure can be with which present. Um, in this case, also the raw data is uh, necessary for us because in case of a fault, we need to do a fault analysis. And so <laughs> to make a long story short, we need uh, the raw data and we need the information that we can obtain from the measurement data. And it, therefore, it would be great or it would be easier to handle all this measurement data if we have a system which can make an indication uh, by, by detecting anomalies with which probability can which problem be present and how could a possible action look like that should be taken now. It would be a great support for us. and. Yeah, it would help us uh, not to reinterpreting measurement data over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So talking so much about data, about these informations, when to take action, what is interesting about it. We have another nice sound today, but the microphones are working very good, I think. Yeah. Before it was only one sound, now it works two. I think it stays with this. Um, talking about all these data um, informations that you get, when to take action, um, Professor Burkholz, is that already kind of an artificial intelligent technology? Do, would you would you name it like this? Um, yeah, you can if if you want. Uh, so I briefly talked uh, about uh, the classifier that decides whether a frame is noise or a signal of interest. Okay, and, uh, signal of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. So this uh, um, this um, um, classifier, that is a statistical classifier that we use, that uh, belongs uh, to machine learning. And uh, machine learning uh, is a subfield of artificial intelligence, if mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so normally people associate with machine learning mostly deep neural network or something like that, because that's in the media all the time. But the statistical classifier that we use here, that is uh, not deep learning in this sense. So it's, it's more, uh, um, yeah, machine learning with, uh, uh, with a relation to statistics. 
All right, and Dr. Uwe Kaltenborn, what would you say about AI? Yeah, so I have there always a very special view on that. So uh, before I want to talk about AI, artificial intelligence, so uh, I still call it advanced statistics. And I think this is still the field we are in. Nevertheless, uh, I think also the picture has shown it very clear. In the moment, we are scratching a little bit in the f on the field of artificial intelligence. And uh, there could be much more behind. Uh, we do not see so far today. So it's like uh, Columbus. So we have started in the harbor in, in Spain and we do not exactly know what will happen when we continue our our travel uh, in the future but in the moment we see there are a big chance also to get additional information on the way when we are when we are going I think it's one of the most interesting fields right now. Of course, when to use artificial intelligence, um, still, I think, and you will be also, I think, uh, of my opinion, that it's still kind of uh, weak, uh, weak uh, artificial intelligence and, and not already the strong artificial intelligence. But as we continue our web talk, perhaps in the next years, we start to talk about strong artificial intelligence and maybe there is a bot sitting here and doing the moderation. We we will see. So, um, we're coming uh, in the next question uh, to Christian Henze. Uh, one of your strengths at uh, Ritz is the industrialization of new products. What are you doing different than others? Could you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, the first point or most important point is to understand the needs uh, of the customer uh, to, to offer a valuable solution. And yeah, usually we talk a lot <laughs> and, <laughs> and write and write it down in an agreed specification that everybody is on the same page what the target of the project is and uh, especially here in Dresden we have a technology center where we have highly qualified colleagues um, we have uh, mechanical engineers electrical engineers chemical engineers but also process engineers uh, that allows us to make a development uh, that can be manufactured in an industrial way mm -hmm. afterwards. Uh, but we also have many technical opportunities. Um, we have uh, different casting equipment depending on the application. And we are able to create our own resin formulations um, that allows us to adopt them also to the, to the application. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we have a lab where we can check all the process parameters that we need. And together with our regional partners, um, like tool makers uh, or special suppliers for, for special housings, uh, we are able to, to offer an integrated value chain to, to our customer. Mm -hmm. As we see now? As we see here, yeah, we have in the slide before, we, we saw the, the core elements. Uh, those core elements we need to stack and as I mentioned earlier we decided to use a, a, st a split core design and yeah so these elements need to stabilize somehow <coughs> uh, and yeah, to protect it from the environment and also to protect it from mechanical stress and uh, to protect the magnetic uh, properties mm -hmm. we decided to to cast the core element in a quite strong epoxy resin and we uh, did uh, lots of thermal cycle tests to assure that no cracks occur. And yeah, as mentioned also before, for the electric shielding, we, we choose an aluminum casting or aluminum housing mm -hmm. uh, where we cast the core with a secondary winding. And the third picture was an example of our casting equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes in the, during the broadcast, uh, we could see it also here live on our table. But um, talking about these instruments, um, Dan Keller here from uh, Highworld, of course, how could you prove that Ritz is doing right? Of course, I just can underline um, the, the main topic is a mutual understanding, a very good understanding. Mm -hmm. and, and the basis of that is a trustful cooperation between, between Highworld and Ritz, especially between the engineers on the technical, uh, to have a good technical basis. Um, 
at the end, uh, if we have the the, um, the final product specification, of course, we defined as High Vault uh, also certain uh, steps for for qualifying for testing um, this this um, HFCT. And of course, the main topic is that there's a very precise definition of the test that we what we what we um, uh, request what 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 we need for our application as well. And um, just some examples, for example, for, uh, during the development. We made certain type tests like switching, lightning tests, like a heat run test, the measurement of the transfer function. We also uh, checked the, the influence um, of the HFCT on the, on the cable system. It's important for the operators at the end. Um, everything what, what we did can be also um, is, will be published in one month um, uh, during the IEEE conference in Vancouver. There is a paper which type tests we did and of course this is one of the main topics if um, the, the, the product itself is okay. A second step is of course the manufacturing process um, of the serious products. And uh, first thing is a very strong cooperation also during the uh, manufacturing um, process. That means during the um, to, to, to optimize the manufacturing process in regards uh, in regards of quality, for example. And we implemented also a three-step test procedure. The first test is um, the test of the, the of, of the plates that we that we receive. So we check the dimensions. The second um, check or the second test part is um, at the end the, the core elements, that means without any housing or windings. So we just uh, check, um, the, the, we measure the inductance and also the transfer function. And afterwards, as soon as we receive the final product, we make an additional test. Mm -hmm. So we uh, check the winding and, and, and of course after the crowding is, is uh, realized, we, we check the transfer function again. Um, in combination, for example, also with the over voltage protection. And this uh, yeah, measurement or, or testing procedures allow us to be very uh, confident in the quality and the function for uh, over 40 years. This is mm -hmm. the, the lifetime, the expected lifetime for such an HFCT. And this is a perfect combination, of course, uh, that you both listen to the needs of the customers and then you can like interact and like modify it all the time. And of course, always uh, for the best for the for the customers. Um, jumping to um, Anita Saupe, so new technologies from, from the lab is one thing, but where are your requirements to allow the installation of the new technology in your grid? I mean, you give the go or the no. Yeah. Uh, as the colleagues mentioned, it is necessary to know the demand of the of the customer. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the developed new technology must meet a need of the TSO. Uh, that means it must bring an added value that will be felt by the end user, not only by us as the TSO also by by everyone who needs energy or supply and yeah we need a um, reduction of the downtimes if this is uh, possible this this is uh, something that would cover one of our demands and based on this we need a reduction of the cost that comes with the downtimes as i mentioned before yeah and if uh, if a new technology will be installed in our grid, mm -hmm. it must be sure that the uh, the other grid components are not negatively affected, mm -hmm. and that the the energy supply, because this this is our main goal, uh, can can continue to be guaranteed. All right, so quite a lot, uh, kind of a cascade to really go through and then only you can give the go and allow yeah. um, uh, others to build, bring in your technology in your grid. Yes. All right, thank you very much. I think over quite interesting what we talk about from different perspectives we're gonna uh, see about the questions what came in until now. Yeah, there's a lot of questions coming in. So there is... One question I will take up directly, and the question is, uh, how long does it take to produce one sensor? And uh, this is an answer, uh, this is very simple, 
sufficiently long and uh, that we can assure ourselves and also our customers from the quality. So, uh, yeah, there's a certain time for all the process steps there. Uh, it's not done in one minute. Uh, nevertheless, quality counts most and therefore I think uh, we can put it as answered. Nevertheless, uh, there are a lot of other questions and uh, there is one question I want to forward uh, to Dan. Uh, how do you transfer the data from the sensor to the processing unit? Mm -hmm. First of all, if we have, uh, if we have the sensor, um, this can be mounted uh, on the, on the uh, um, for example, on the on the earthing stations that we have every 12 kilometers, and so it's this sensor will be mounted um, uh, under the earth or in, within within the earth. It will be buried, and there will be a measuring cable. It will be a twin axe cable that transfers the, the measuring signal, the measuring signal itself, um, to our digitalization unit. From the digitalization unit, uh, there are different possibilities. First of all, we have, um, if, if it is possible and available, um, the data can be transferred via fiber optic um, cable to to an um, to a main unit. Um, if this is not available, uh, we we can also include, for example, LTE modems um, that transfer the data that transfer the data um, uh, wireless. Yeah, so uh, next question. I that I now I flipped around here with uh, my mouse here. I there that goes again into the direction of the 525 kV cables. I think uh, this is also very interesting. Uh, Germany as the front runner installing the first very long distance cables there. I it's very clear and the question which came up is how mature is the technology for uh, this kind uh, of cables? So uh, maybe Anita you can give some uh, insights there. Uh, it's a technology which was uh, s uh, already set up uh, some years ago. Uh, as the person responsible for monitoring, how secure do you feel about the basic technology? Um, okay, how secure you feel about um, setting up new technology in our grid yeah. on high voltage DC, DC cables? Uh, yeah, when implementing uh, new technologies in our grid, there are uh, with external partners. Um, there are some some needs or uh, some some guidelines that need to be covered, for example, conditions of purchase, uh, the, the guidelines for procurement and the code of conduct for suppliers and our, our quality assurance specifications. Yeah, this applies a standard and we will make no compromises uh, there because the, the security of the energy supply depends on the quality of our work and it depends on the quality of our assets. And we ensure this. And here yeah, I'm seeing, I think that we're then on a, on a secure side, I would call it. And yeah. Yeah, maybe to add on that, so there was from all the uh, big German TSOs was also then a qualification test for this kind of cables, which was successfully uh, executed for all the suppliers of that. Uh, there was also <coughs> a uh, German specification and standard, uh, which also implies then higher requirements than uh, the conventional standards uh, have pre-described so far, so therefore we can be uh, fairly sure that uh, we start there with a technology which is a safe technology. Okay, saying that, uh, there uh, is another question regarding uh, the economics of uh, monitoring and uh, 
that's the question about typical downtime costs and what downtime reduction can be achieved with online monitoring. So I think this is a, a wide open question uh, and that will also depend also from the individual uh, failure, breakdown uh, or incident, what could happen there. And uh, yeah, so any indications from the round here? Who jumps I can say what what I can say what I can say uh, out of that because I I, <laughs> I made I made already uh, several um, calculations out of that and this really depends um, um, on on the energy that is transmitted and in addition also on uh, the costs for for an alternative way for example if it is not possible to use a certain transmission line so we have a lot of influences um, for for such an for for for, for typical downtime cost but what can be said what, what, what can be said is um, each day for if, if we transfer an, an uh, power of one megawatt or even larger up to two or three um, um, gigawatt um, of course we will have a lot of um, costs if you calculate the price per kilowatt hour if it is not transmitted for example and um, this can be considered and, and calculated yeah but giving a real number, it's a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I would say it, it really depends on a certain on a certain project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we stay with data, so that's now a question which is uh, dedicated to the TSO perspective. But I would like to widen it a little bit. Um, from a TSO perspective, do you want to get the raw data from monitoring or do you want to get the information uh, from a sensor? And uh, maybe this is then also a split question, so uh, maybe Anita can give a perspective. Do you want raw data or information from a sensor? And uh, then uh, Peter can maybe give us some insights. Uh, what is the potential of working with raw data uh, beyond the patterns which are already known? And maybe what, what can happen when we can enrich data? So maybe we have to split it a little bit. So uh, maybe Peter first? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think... Um we have to detect the the events of interest uh, first uh, because we simply cannot store all the data that we uh, potentially capture so i think we ha we have to make a, some kind of intelligent decision uh, at the very beginning and then only process the data uh, that we that we think are, are worth uh, of processing um but of course uh, it is uh, it is a question of where do we uh how how do we uh, make the selection ne? what what uh, variety of signals would we select for first analysis and which would we discard um, wh when we are quite sure a, a frame of signal is just noise and we can can certainly discard that and would not have any benefit of uh, learning uh, additional things but we ha when we just have an, an unknown kind of signal which is not just noise within a frame it's certainly uh, worse um, collecting that and then uh, perform a kind of clustering to possibly, um, yeah, later on detect uh, different kinds of defects um, and and so learn something new and also be able to monitor the aging, for example, of a defect in the cable. Um, but but I think these are these are things that we need to see in in, in field experiments. So we we have too little. Uh, data to to make a definite to give it a definite answer yet so we really have to apply it to to uh, to the field Anita do you want to have the raw data or do you want to have the information to take decisions yeah as i mentioned before we need both the raw data and the information that we can obtain from the measurement raw data at, at the first point, it is pretty important and pretty helpful to get an, an indication what what is this upcoming failure about and how can we localize this. And when we have an... At the second point, when we have an upcoming failure and 
we not only can do a repairing, we also have to do an analysis of the of the of the failure cause, yeah, so that we can uh, take care that it will not upcoming again. So, yeah, both informations are necessary for us as a TSO, the obtained information from the measurement data and the raw data itself. All right. Over one or two more questions two before more we questions. come to the final statements. Because one question I'm personally interested in and the other one uh, is definitely interesting for all. The personal interest uh, is uh, a question to uh, Christian uh, with Ritz uh, doing the, the sensors. Uh, how much are you interested also to integrate the electronics and uh, the uh, digital processing more in future than also in, in, into your products? We, uh, yeah, in our headquarter in Hamburg, we, we already have an electronic department uh, because we also sell, let's call it electronic sensors. Uh, but to be realistic in, in that project, I mean, it's a, it's a high volt project at the end. And uh, we were asked to, to help with the industrialization of the, of the sensors. So at this point, I would say our knowledge is, is limited uh, regarding this um, data acquisition and data processing. Yeah, maybe to reformulate it, non-conventional instrument transformers will be definitely uh, something which will be in the clear focus. Yes, uh, they are. I mean, we have a catalog uh, for, for non-conventional instrument transformers. Uh, with I think we sell them like uh, the 1980s. And so it's uh, maybe for us they are not the, the most important role at the moment, but I think the, the importance will increase during the next years. Okay, final question. Mm -hmm. Our industry is very conservative. And uh, that's uh, something we know. <laughs> Monitoring is new, it's a new technology, we know as well. And the question is, how difficult is it to convince very experienced experts in the field to install a new monitoring system? I think uh, it's a question maybe Anita and maybe Dan can give a short answer <laughs> because we are very close to uh, 4 p.m. So yeah. therefore, a short answer. Uh, maybe, maybe I can start if Dan... Yeah. Don't mind. Um, how, how difficult is? The, I think we are in a we are we are in a changing in a changing time. So even even um, experts with a long with a long of with long term experience uh, understand or, or are changing mind and say, okay, uh, we have a new new technology, new cables. Um, let's try everything that is possible to get information out. Of the cables. This, this is one point. Of course, there, uh, it's not it's not easy just to say let me install everything. We, we have to be very carefully uh, with convincing that the technology works and that there is also an an outcome. That means from 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 knowledge and of course that there is a, a, a major benefit for the operator at the end. This is what my experience is um, with this product. And Anita, of course, you can like also adjust then your final statement to the round after your answer. All right. Yeah, to convince experienced cuts, um, it is necessary that the new technology, in, in each case, it is necessary that the new technology should be in implemented in the transmission grid, meets uh, or delivers a concrete value, uh, added value for the company, yeah? And if this is visibly given, the use of the new technology can be well justified. But, yeah, nevertheless, the, the purpose, the necessity, and the cost of a new technology, yeah, are critically excellent. And this goes over several instances and it is determined whether it is actually necessary to use mm. this new technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my final statement about 
high voltage power cable monitoring is that I think that this is a possibility a possibility to to keep the balance between the efficient using of the transmission grid and of the protection of the asset. <laughs> Great. We're doing the final round, of course, here cable monitoring was our subject field. First field experience with DC cables done. Your final statement about yeah. what you learned in this hour and what you want to conclude. Yeah. Well, what we can say is um, the structure of the transmission um, systems uh, are changing at the moment. And this worldwide, step by step. Germany is a pioneer, this is what we, what we t uh, heard today, in changing such a structure. And um, Germany and the German teams always have an um, impact, a, big, a major impact on the future standards um, and the, as they are the front runners. Highvolt, as we, as we saw, is an innovation leader in the field of the quality control. Um, and due to the experience uh, that we have, We are, we are developing new solutions that contribute to the reliable energy transmission system for the future. Then Dr. Christian Henze from RITZ, your final statement to this round of today's talk. Yeah. So I think uh, we are all on the same page when I say that the ener energy <laughs> transition is a major challenge uh, for all of us. And I'm convinced that we need projects like, like this to be successful. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, yeah, security of the energy supply. So to have a, a stable network like we have it today, to have it in future or to keep it in the future. And I'm sure that the RITZ group um, can give an important contribution in that field of uh, measurement, protection and monitoring of energy systems mm -hmm. or especially electrical energy systems. All right, thank you very much. And Professor Birkholz from the TU Dresden, your fin final conclusio? Um, so, okay, I, uh, um, I mean, I, I like this interdisciplinary approach that we took together with Highvolt in the last three years. And uh, that was uh, a, a very good experience for me also to see how methods uh, from, from modern signal processing, which, which are already yeah, quite known for, for a few years uh, in the signal processing society, um, how, how they can be applied with a, with a good benefit to a field like high voltage cable monitoring. And I see, see a, a big potential for the future in this interdisciplinary research. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your positive feedback. Uwe, I'm coming to you because we have to announce something, ladies and gentlemen, the High Vault Web Talk. Thank you to Anita, Peter, Christian and to Dan, because, Uwe, we have a next round and this is a special round next week. Yeah, right. So next week we will have the session Ask the Experts Open Question Session. We have invited a lot of our experts there. You can see the announcement uh, later on. And if you have questions which are really burning and you want to have an answer from us, then you can send it to webtalk at highvolt.com. Already from now on, this is free yeah, that's to free that bring in your questions from now on. This is already open to okay. uh, take up the questions so that we have then also a list of questions which we can already hand over to the experts for next week. Great. I think today we had an excellent session here with a wide uh, uh, spectra of uh, experience and uh, I would like to take the chance to uh, give from here also a special thank to uh, some guys which are really important that we get, for instance, especially the sensor done here and that's uh, Gottfried Schuster uh, because uh, he has made it really possible that we get all the things in time mm -hmm. and uh, why he is uh, so important because he has already casted the uh, samples for my PhD work so uh, very okay. successful also there we had crazy <laughs> ideas to do and he was really make it, making it possible and therefore special thanks uh, to him and his team Great. nevertheless back to you you have the last word today that's from my side please be with us next uh, Tuesday uh, at 3 p.m course, uh, 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. We are sending uh, broadcasting all around the world. Thank you very much for being with us live today. And it's the only thing that we can say. We say goodbye. Auf Wiedersehen und Tschüss aus Dresden.